Welcome to Unleashed at Work and Home, the show dedicated to helping veterinarians, vet techs, dog trainers, shelter and rescue workers, pet sitters, and all the other animal crazy pet professionals manage their stress and find more joy. I'm your host, Colleen Pilar, and I'm thrilled you're here with us today. Make sure you hit the subscribe button on your favorite app so that you won't miss a single episode. This episode is brought to you by our free community, the Circle of Resilient and Thriving Pet Professionals. If you like the ideas shared here, then you're invited to continue the conversation with other lifelong learners in the community. You can find out more at ColleenPilar.com. It's the perfect place for you to learn cool stuff, feel good, and take action to create the life you love. Come join us. Welcome back. My guest today is Lauren Van Duzer. I'm so happy to have you here today, Lauren. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. As you know, I start most of my shows with the question of how did you become a dog trainer? Like what did you think would happen in your life and how did it all turn out? So can you can you take us back in time and, and take us to, you know, 10 or 11 years old and everybody, that's everyone's favorite question. What are you going to be when you grow up? What was your answer? Yeah, so I thought I was going to be a veterinarian. <laughs> you know, I've always wanted to help animals and I've always gravitated towards them. Um, I would definitely say if there were loose animals in our neighborhood, they came to my house. <laughs> uh, and so that's where I started. And I always found refuge with them so I could trust them in a different way than I could with people. Like I had to hide who I was in some ways around people. And around animals, it didn't have to do that. So I just felt so comfortable around them. And equally, I hope they felt as comfortable around me as I did them, right? So I did think I was going to be a veterinarian very early on. And then as I got a little older, I've always had a huge affinity for horses. And so you might say, well, why are you a dog trainer? <laughs> but I, uh, my ultimate goal is to get back into horses. Um, there was just a, um, a bit of a barrier or two there for me for a while. Um, but my ultimate goal is to get back with horses. In training, get back to training yeah. horses or okay. Well, I, I didn't train horses myself. I was helping a trainer. So she, she would have me get on the horse and she would tell me exactly what to do. So I would help her with ponies, which was perfect because I had a slim stature <laughs> mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I really enjoyed them and I loved how spicy they were too. So <laughs> that's where I started. And so how did you get from horses to dogs? Uh, yes. So uh, the financial barrier brought me back to dogs because dogs are much more accessible and easy to have in your house, unlike horses. So <laughs> that's really where I started with dogs. Um, and I can circle that into how my specific dog that got me started. Would that be okay to start with? Sure. Okay. So I had a beagle mix or a, a beagle mix and a purebred beagle and a cat at the time. I was a teenager. And um, my beagle was showing aggression to the other animals in the home and to strangers. So I didn't know what I was doing. And I did what a lot of traditional training or traditional thought process was, which was mm -hmm. just punish the dog for the behavior you don't want to see. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the aggression got worse. So I was crying all the time. <laughs> I was like, there has to be a better way. And so I fortunately went to the library and found Pat Miller's book and uh, Jane Killian, who her last name is different now and I can't pronounce it. Um, but uh, those were the two books that really changed my world. And I'm so fortunate that I picked up books with positive training in it mm -hmm. uh, because there are so many books in the library. It's like, why is that still yeah. there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, once I found how to change my dog's behavior and understand him differently, then I was hooked. I was like, this is what I'm going to do. Like, I need to help people. I have the golden ticket. <laughs> so really th that fast, like you saw it working with your own dog yeah. and then it became like 
your your job, like what you wanted to do oh, with yeah. your life. Absolutely. I have a, had a huge affinity with it from the beginning. So once I discovered clicker training and shaping, I was like, wow, this is so much fun. And I did it for, I don't know, maybe several months to a year before I decided to do an apprenticeship with a behaviorist. And um, from there, I knew that that's, that's where I was headed and I haven't looked back. How long ago was that? 2010. 2010. Okay, so you did the apprenticeship with the behaviorist, and then did you open Happy Hounds right away? Like, did you start out on your own, or were you a part of another company for a Good while question. first? Yes, there was a, a lot of anxiety about opening my own business. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I stayed with the behaviorist for a while. I worked under her for maybe a year or two, and then um, was kind of pushed out on my feet and opened the business. <laughs> Um, actually, um, my brother passing away made me realize that I need to, to live my life fully. And that's why I opened the business when I did. That's a really powerful statement. Your brother passing away made you realize that you needed to do it. So, so you did. So you took action on that big, scary dream. What did you learn about yourself as a result of, of going out on your own and And making that happen. That I'm not as much of an introvert as I thought. Oh, interesting. (laughs) I know. So I was always very shy. And I discovered it was because of the way that I was raised. I learned to be quiet and to hide parts of myself, which I Mm -hmm. kind of alluded to earlier. Um, And So once I opened my business and I had to interact with people more, I was like, I kind of like it, you know, so I enjoy it. And so I've, I've learned a lot of ways to communicate with people differently than I used to. Like I used to have anger problems (laughs) uh, because I felt so misunderstood. Right. So I can really identify with the animals that I'm trying to help. And the people who are so frustrated with them, you know, like it comes out as anger and often there's a lot of caring behind there. They just Mm -hmm. don't know how to get through and there they are. Yeah. Yeah. But I would definitely say that's the biggest thing I learned about myself is that I really do enjoy being around people and connecting with them, which came as a surprise to me as it started to unfold. And it definitely took years. It was not an overnight thing. Uh, lots of learning for sure and falling on my face. But once I got up and started to realize that, oh, I can use my positive techniques in a different way and I can be positive with the people rather than being combative, then really opened things up for me. You said a lot of falling on your face. Was it really a lot or did it just feel like a lot at the time? It was a, uh, it was not a lot. It was, that's a good, a good way to reframe it. Right. So it was very hurtful when I would fall on my face, (laughs) not physically, literally, but emotionally. And, uh, that was where the learning was happening. It's interesting. I, I have a resistance to falling on my face as well. Um, (laughs) and I find that in my head, when I'm learning something, I'm pretty sure I'm going to fall on my face a lot. And the reality is I do fall on my face a little and mm-hmm. it hurts and I learn and I get up and move on. Um, yeah. So I was curious if if the a lot is an actual feeling as you look back on it, or if it really is a sort of a combination of that fear that we all hold of like, oh, and the fact that there were there were moments, but overall... It sounds like you've navigated it all pretty well. And here this business still is years later because you were brave enough to start it and to have those experiences. Yeah. So you're not as introverted as you thought you were. And now you've referenced twice a little bit about um, that there were there were parts of yourself you felt you needed to hide. And of course, everyone has parts of themselves they need to hide. Like, I don't think it's really the goal that we all let it all hang out all the time. But 
just from a perception of of feeling like yourself, like you can bring your full self into your work. Do you mostly feel like you have that now? Like you really can be Lauren, the true, honest, sincere Lauren. Okay. For sure. And that is one of the biggest reasons that I wanted to, like I pushed myself in a few ways to open the business because I felt like if I did it under somebody else's authority, then I wouldn't let myself grow enough to face my fears. And so going out and making my own business and continuing it is one of those ways that I rebel (laughs) against what I was taught when I was younger. (laughs) So interesting. I have a million follow-up questions, but I promised you before we recorded, this was not a coaching session. (laughs) You can go for it. I'm I'm ready. (laughs) Well, let's, let's keep a nice broad view here. What do you know to be true about yourself now as a result of all of this that that you wish you could have told yourself back then? And how do you think that might be common for others who are are putting themselves out there? I don't know. I mean, honestly, Colleen, I feel like that's a heavy question for me. It is a heavy question. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You know, so I have dealt with anxiety and depression on and off all my life. And so I would definitely have to say that Looking back to my younger self, I would remind myself that I am strong enough, even though I don't feel like it. And that would be one of the biggest things that I would just want to tell myself from before. Yeah, I think I think that is a message that can apply to so many of us, too. I am strong enough, even though I don't feel like it. Because most of us do have plenty of evidence looking in the rearview mirror that there were things we didn't think we could handle that we did. Might not have been with as much grace as we wanted or, you know, the beautiful way we would have liked things to turn out. But we handled them and we got through things and we're stronger than we realize, but we don't always feel it. So to know I am strong enough, even though I don't always feel it, is it's just honest and true. It's a simple kind of touchstone. Do you feel it more often now? Like, do you have to remind yourself of that often? Or is it a little bit more true in your bones these days than it was back then? It's definitely more true in my bones, but I definitely do still have to coach myself through some days. <laughs> I think we so all have having, to coach ourselves yeah. sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I will notice a thought that I have like anxious about um, that somebody didn't respond when I asked them to or when it's a client. Right. Mm-hmm. But um, and then I, I go down an anxiety spiral and then, you know, have all of those side effects of anxiety. And it's like, oh, stop. I had to like pause for a moment and reframe my thoughts. Yeah. And it's. That's actually the one that comes up so often with people is they tell me that they didn't hear back from a client. It's not usually that they heard back from a client who was angry or upset. It's that they didn't hear back and that their brain will then go to places of, oh, they're probably mad at me or, oh, they didn't like what I said about this or, oh, they're upset about how expensive I am or, oh, all the things. Um, And it's really interesting how it's this lack of feedback that is in some ways even worse because our brains just fill it in. I just feel like that's so related to dog training Mm -hmm. because so many people don't give enough feedback to their dogs or other animals, whatever animal they're interacting with. And I'm constantly telling my clients, give him feedback, say something to him. He's looking for your, he's looking for something from you. And, you know, we are really so, similar. Yeah, we really are. We really are. It is it's very interesting to me to talk to people not in the in the world of pet professionals about behavior and why humans are the way they are and why dogs are the way they are and whether I can talk about that overlap in a way that is comfortable for them. There are some people who 
do not want to think there's any similarities. <laughs> and there are some people who are like, well, of course, that totally makes sense. Um, but I often say that that we behave you know, from the emotion spot almost all the time. We have the ability to be rational thinking creatures, like when you said, where you catch yourself in the anxiety spiral and then you know what to do about it. Well, that's an awesome use of your more advanced brain. But your more advanced brain wasn't there in the moment that you went spiraling off into, uh uh-oh. Right. And so we have both. We have both, but our natural instinctive tendencies are very much like dogs, that we are responding in the moment to the emotions and sensations and experiences that we're having. And it's not, it's not our big old human brains that are driving almost ever. (laughs) Right. (laughs) We have to call them back in. Hello, brain. Are you here with me? Come on back. Um, So tell me a little bit about your work. You work with um, dogs who have aggression issues. What is your favorite kind of situation to work with? So my favorite kind of situation to work with is um, I would say that it is more about the relationship between the team members than a specific behavior, because I'm really flexible with working with really almost any behaviors. But if there's a person who's really in tune or trying to get that connection with their dog, then those are my favorite people to work with. And most of the time I have sensitive dogs. And that really speaks to me. I am a softie. (laughs) So when I see a dog who you can see the fear in their face and they're looking to their owner for some type of feedback and their owner is like so frustrated and they're like, I don't know what to do here. Being able to come in and help bridge that gap and help them communicate in a new way. That's really my favorite. So it doesn't have to be a specific behavior type. It's just going to be are they really both trying to reach each other? Can you tell us about a recent one where, where you feel like they were able to communicate now? Yes, I would love to. <laughs> this is my favorite thing. <laughs> um, so I have a client with a German Shepherd and she got him as a puppy. And, you know, she thinks, okay, great. I'm going to set him up for success. And she has. However, he's a German Shepherd with working lines and he's in a pet home. So (laughs) you can imagine how that's going. Mm -hmm. So we've done a lot of work together over the last year and a half. And about nine months ago is when she really understood him. And I could see that shift in her and I could see her breathing easier And just loving him for who he is instead of being anxious about who he's supposed to be. And I love being a guide in that. Like It it means so much to me to be able to offer that platform and the bridge for people to to meet their dogs on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And by doing that, you're doing that for her too. Yeah, You're loving absolutely. her as she is and not for who you think she's supposed to be, which she yep. feels like she she knows that you're accepting her as a learner um, and and admiring her efforts that she's putting into meeting this dog where he is. And I used to be her. Yeah. And I think that's what is so magical about it for me is that I was in that position and I didn't have somebody that would help me or that could help me, or I didn't know where to look. And um, I did try traditional trainers with my beagle and I thought they were a crock of two. (laughs) Uh, So, you know, that's what led me to digging deeper and all of that. So I feel so fortunate that I get to be a part of that journey with people and their animals. And so he is a working German shepherd that starts and lunges because he's fearful, he's hurting, and he's a frustrated greeter. (laughs) (laughs) He's got all the things going on. (laughs) Uh, But he is an amazing dog. I love being around him and I love being around her because of how in tune they are with each other, but also how big of a heart that dog has. Yeah, it is so cool when you can feel that and know that you've 
made it better and easier for both of them to appreciate each other and to have mm-hmm. joyful experiences together, you know? It's what they both want and it's not what they had. So I ask all of my guests to share some words that have meaning to them and there's no rules on the words. And you gave me some very interesting words I'm super curious about. Your words were, and beyond. What does that mean to you? It means a lot of things. So first of all, let me tell you the significance of it. And then I'll go into more detail about what it really means to me. So it's at the end of my business name. It's Happy Hounds and Beyond. I did that on purpose. (laughs) And it's also from Toy Story to Infinity and Beyond. My wife and I have the matching tattoos. So I have the and beyond tattooed on my forearm. (laughs) And my wife has the to infinity on her arm. So the significance of it to me, it's multi-layered. But to start um, with my wife, of course, it's all about love and it's infinite. Mm -hmm. And then we wrap that around into everything else. And beyond means, okay, well, you can make a statement, but how about can you go beyond that? Can we go beyond the label on the dog? Can we go beyond, quote unquote, mindfulness? Like, does it have to just be the label that somebody's putting on something? And I really like to think of it as just like not fitting inside of the box, going out beyond what everybody thinks is okay or going beyond what's normal and really finding out for yourself what is it that you want to fill into the blank i love that i need to kind of absorb it a little bit i wondered if it was related to toy story which is interesting that that the the two words just randomly coming into my awareness can be tied so so directly to something like that. Um, but it the way you've described that is very much a life philosophy and a, a way of mm-hmm. being. When did this become the phrase for you? Do you know? Did, are you aware? Um, I think it was around the time I named the business. I think my wife and I already had the tattoos at that time. And... I was toying around with a lot of different ideas, but I definitely was living by this philosophy for a while before I named it. Um, But yeah, I think it was around that time. So like 13 years ago. Well, hold on a second. The business is only eight years old. I've been in, I've been doing training for 13 years. Um, So yeah, I guess it was right around when my brother died. A lot of my life changed around then. so. I can use that as a landmark that that really skyrocketed so much of me growing mm-hmm. because I lived a very scared life before and I didn't want to do that anymore. So I guess that's what you could say. That's where it really changed and beyond. Yeah. And beyond became a thing. And is and beyond something that you and your wife moved toward together or is it something you introduced to her? And resonated with both of you or she introduced to you or? No, you know, I don't think Amy and I have ever talked about that. Like we've never had a discussion about this. Um, You know, we do talk philosophically quite a bit, but um, not with the phrase itself. Was she in your life at the time your brother died? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's a big reason why I survived that for sure. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I, I would say that we both live that way already and sometimes if I'm not thinking in that way she'll say something and I'll be like oh I need to open back up (laughs) Mm -hmm. and stop being closed-minded or whatever the situation is but yeah we definitely both you know we kind of echo and bounce off of each other with that yeah and we all need people like that in our lives who Mm -hmm. who help us see beyond what we're setting up for ourselves that there is more available if we can just expand the view a bit. I love that. And I love that it's a tattoo. I love that you've, I mean, like it's, those those are your words, your business name, they're on your body, they're your philosophy. 
they they change things. So you've introduced so many deep topics here, I have to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you feel free to go down a rabbit hole. I'm I'm going to wade into one just a little if I can. Uh, And and if you're uncomfortable, then we'll cut it. So fair enough. Um, Your brother, can you tell us a little bit about him? Yeah. Uh, He was the person I was closest to in my family. He was the person I didn't have to hide from that I was closest to um, when I was younger. And... Oh, I really felt seen by him and his passing was a huge blow, of course, as any would be, but um, it was just a really big challenge, you know, going from having your best friend being a part of your family to no longer being able to see that person or physically touch them. Yeah, But I definitely will say spiritually, I can feel him. People used to ask me, like, have you been to the cemetery? I'd be like, no, he's not there. He's in here. (laughs) In the room with me, he's here. (laughs) And he'll he'll visit me in dreams and things like that. Um, But yeah, I would definitely say he was very soft sometimes but very much an adrenaline junkie too. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, But he was just really easy to get along with. He was funny and don't know what else to say about him at the moment. He's just, he was a really big part of my life. And he's an older brother? Younger. Younger. And a really big part of your life. I'm sorry that you lost him. And I'm so glad that you, took his inspiration to share more with the world because there's a lot more happening in the world as a result of you showing up as yourself mm-hmm. to to interact with people and to change things for dogs and, and all around because you stopped being scared and small. That's really mm-hmm. beautiful. So, um, so now I've made me cry, which was not the goal. <laughs> It's not the goal to make either of us cry, but it's always not the goal to make me cry because that's so easy to do. I try to avoid it, but it's unavoidable. <laughs> um, but thank you for telling us about him. Could you could you just tell us his name? Matthew. Matthew. So Matthew, Matthew played a big role in you becoming the you that's here now. That's and right. the you that's here now knows that she's pretty strong. Yeah. And She's pretty capable and she's making a big difference. What does the future hold for you? Um, Well, I have dreams and goals for sure. (laughs) Um, I would say the future is going to be helping more people and dogs by bringing more of my content online so I can help more globally. And with the with the dog screening business, that's as far as I've gone. <laughs> Fair enough. But I know that I want to do horse training. So I want to get my own horses and experiment with them. And then I want to offer positive horse training. Um, and I want to see more people understand what they're doing to their animals when they're not using positive technique and seeing and really understanding what's happening for them. Like, can you put yourself in your animal's position? Can you understand why they would be scared? Can you understand why they would bite in a situation? Yeah. It makes such a huge difference. And I think that I, I am not a horse person. I don't know much about horses, but what I've heard is that the horse world is not moving as quickly toward, toward some of the more positive methods as the dog world has. Mm-hmm. The dog world is certainly having its own growing pains and all of that. Yes, but <laughs> um, to have people who are are fluent in training both species, I think can only help because so many of the reasons things have to be the way they are, are uh, species specific. And when you can say, well, no, actually horses and dogs are quite different about this particular thing. And yet this technique is a helpful technique mm-hmm. for both um, that can 
it can just level it out a little, I think, for some people who are just so certain that dogs need someone to tell them who's boss or whatever the, you know, whatever the philosophy is related to the species. Um, so I think that that will be cool. If if you could set a timeline, when will there be a, to- a horse in your life? Oh my God, tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> if I could do that, yes. <laughs> Well, I hope it's soon then. I hope it's soon that you're counting down for this. So if people wanted to learn more about you and your work, how could they do that? They could go to happyhoundsandbeyond.com and they could also go to my YouTube, which you can find on the website. Okay. And I'll link to both of those in the show notes so that people can find them. And they will remember it's happy hounds and beyond because of our words. Because earlier when I said it, I only said happy hounds. But I will never forget now that it's Happy Hounds and beyond. So thanks so much for joining me today. This was an awesome conversation. I'm so glad you came, Lauren. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to Unleashed at Work and Home. I invite you to come learn more at ColleenPilar.com where you can be steady, be strong, and be long.